Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Cody Neer. Um, my collaborator on this project and presentation is Xavier Ho, uh, who's also here. Our talk today is uh, Drawing Queer Intersections Through Video Game Archives. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in just a second. Um, I briefly wanted to highlight that this is work that is drawing on the LGBTQ video game archive. I'll put a link to that in the chat in just a moment. And I also wanted to draw attention to um, a lab that I have the great honor of co-directing with Margaret Ree at University at Buffalo. It's the Paula Light Lab. It's a queer and feminist uh, new media and digital media lab um, that works primarily with electronic literature, uh, video games, and other forms of digital media. Um, so the presentation today is going to focus on some visualizations of the LGBTQ video game archive, and I will put that in the chat. Because uh, I would really encourage you as I'm sort of talking through uh, some of these visualizations to to go ahead and explore some of these links too. So uh, the LGBTQ video game archive is an archive started uh, founded by Adrian Shaw at Temple University. Um, it's the goal of the archive is to collect all sort of examples of queer content in video games, uh, really since video games got started in the 70s and the 80s. Um, and so the archive collects um, both records of those examples and then wherever possible copies of those bits of content too, whether that be videos, blog posts, write ups of the content, whatever it is. Um, and the work that we're presenting today is some visualizations of the archive, the content in the archive. So it's visualizations of what queer content has looked like in video games throughout the history of video games. Um, and I put that link into the chat as well. And like I said, I, I would encourage you to just kind of click through those links and explore a little bit uh, as I'm talking through this. Um, these visualizations started off um, as Queer Intersections in Video Games, a project I did while a graduate student at Michigan State University um, and part of the Cultural Heritage Informatics Fellowship there. Um, and Xavier and I have really been working on updating and expanding these visualizations. Uh, in their original forms, they're really kind of simple counting of types of content, and we're really interested in expanding and uh, um, updating that. Um, so the first stage of this work, um, as I said, was really just kind of counting the types of content, just counting the numbers of certain characters or um, types of stories. Um, and where we're hoping to take the work next is really starting to dig into uh, the data and look at more of the trends, the changes over time in representation, rather than just noting the types of content or the amount of content. So, and uh, in terms of those types of content, uh, the chart that I've got on the screen right now is a visualization of just sort of the overall amount of queer content in video games by decade. Um, and I, you can see in the title, I put the sort of it gets better thing because there's a common sort of narrative about queer representation that it's getting better over time. Like, oh, in the past there wasn't as much queer representation and now there's more of it. Um, and from what we've seen in the archive, that's definitely true, uh, but that's really only sort of the, the very surface level of the story. You can see in the 1980s, um, there's just sort of a smaller amount of video games overall, but certainly a small amount of queer content. Um, and that through the decades, there's sort of an exponential growth of queer content. Um, I should also note that the 2010s here in this chart is, is kind of incomplete. That's very much in progress as we're collecting different examples um, and including that in the data set. Um, you'll notice that the most common type of queer content is characters. Um, and that sort of has stayed true throughout. But there's also been some minor shifts in that in the 2000s, you can see one of the sort of growing uh, types of queer content was relationships in games. So games that would let you choose to romance different characters, uh, develop relationships with different characters. Um, and that that was one of the really sort of growing segments of content, um, though that seems to have shrunk a bit in the 2010s as um, as queer content has moved away from looking at uh, re uh, relationships as much. Um, another trend that isn't necessarily present in this chart but is very relevant is that a lot of the sort of uh, content in the 1980s and 1990s 
um, has sort of a negative valence to it and that it's often sort of queer characters or mentions of queer people or queer content that are kind of like pejorative or they're used as jokes or they're in some way marked as negative. Um, and that changes a lot when you get to the 2010s when suddenly we, uh, not suddenly, but like we have a lot more examples of positive queer content. So characters who are presented in a more positive light, they're not just villains, they're not just jokes. Um, and so the archives also tracking that sort of positive and negative um, in the representation as well. But as I said, the, the sort of uh, narrative of the it gets better over time where queer representation in video games is just, you know, we're getting more of it and that's good and it's getting more positive. That's really only sort of part of the story. And as we're digging into the trends in the data, we're starting to unearth some, some like more interesting um, examples of how representation in uh, video games has changed over time. So for example, the two charts I've got on the screen right now are looking at uh, sexuality um, in queer uh, content uh, in the 1980s and the 2000s. You'll notice that in the 1980s, um, there's a much larger sort of percent of that content. And it's also worth noting that that's still sort of a small overall amount of content. It's only about like 20 or so examples of queer content. Um, but there's a much larger sort of proportion of that content that is uh, representations of uh, lesbian women. Um, and that there's also this sort of large indiscernible category. And that indiscernible category is examples of queer content where the character is in some way marked as queer, but it doesn't sort of express or explicitly say any sort of sexuality. It doesn't sort of uh, um, define themselves in any particular way. Um, and that's something that I'll return to in a little bit as one of the difficulties of doing this work. There often aren't moments in games where characters will stop and be like, hey, by the way, I'm trans, or like, hey, by the way, I'm a lesbian. Um, it's often sort of inferred through uh, bits of dialogue or uh, bits of text in the game or, or really just like hinted at in a way that we have to kind of discern um, uh, what the character is or how they identify. Um, but then you'll notice in the 2000s that we see like a lot of shifts in sort of who is represented, um, what types of queer life are represented in video games. Um, you'll see that gay men uh, sort of grow quite a bit, as does the representation of bisexual people. Um, and one of the things that, uh, like, as we're noticing these trends, we're also starting to try and like figure out like why these trends existed. Uh, but one of the things that stands out to me here is that uh, well, the growth in like bisexual representation is great. Um, like it seems to come at the expense of lesbian representation in games, right? Like lesbian representation shrinks, whereas gay men, gay male representation really expands by the 2000s. Um, and so there's something I think to be said for um, how that expansion of bisexual representation comes at the expense of, of the sort of representation of lesbian women in interesting ways. Um, and we're interested in digging into more. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I'm hearing somebody else. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, the, one of the other trends that we've really seen in the data as we dig into it is sort of growing whiteness of uh, a queer representation in games. So again, you'll see a comparison of two different charts here, uh, video games with queer content in the 1990s and those in the 2000s. Um, you'll see that there's again sort of this indeterminate category that's usually representations of queer characters who are not any sort of discernible particular race or ethnic background. Uh, they're just sort of a, uh, a generally kind of like brown character that's never sort of tied to any culture or heritage or anything like that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we've got like indeterminacy both sort of in their gender or uh, sexuality, but then also sometimes in terms of their racial identity. Um, but it's really conspicuous how throughout the decades you would expect with the narrative of it getting better that you would also see sort of a growth in racial diversity and queer representation. And at least through the 2000s, we actually don't see that as much. We see a growing proportion of queer representation is actually increasingly white. Um, 
And we have some thoughts about why that might be, whether that be sort of post 9-11 American culture, rising sort of xenophobia, racism, white supremacy in American culture after 9-11. Hi, are we Thanks. back? Yeah, we're back, Cody. We lost you there for, for, for a while. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay, um, let me pull that back up and sorry about that. Um, no worries. And you have around uh, four minutes left. Okay, that's great. Uh, people can see the screen share again, okay? We can see it. Okay, so I'll just run through sort of the last slides pretty quickly then. Um, so another thing that we're tracking in the archive is sort of where queer representation is being made in games. Uh, this chart sort of traces through each decade uh, where the games were made of their country of origin. Um, interestingly, here you can see that for most of the history of video games, most of the queer content was made in Japan. Um, with the United States usually a little bit behind, um, and that changes in the 2010s, though again, our 2010s data is incomplete. We're still sort of collecting those examples. Um, we're also looking at sort of representation of human versus non-human characters. So non-human characters could include uh, characters who are aliens, monsters, fantasy races, uh, different uh, sort of non-human types of characters. Um, and that, uh, it, this is an area where it's definitely incomplete with the 2010s, we need more data about it, but we see sort of a steady increase in the amount of non-human representation, which is interesting to put alongside then that growing whiteness in queer representation in video games too. Um, most of the content, uh, uh, most of the queer content in games is optional content. They're side characters, they're optional relationships, they're things that the player doesn't have to engage in if they don't want to. Um, and that's particularly conspicuous, especially when you compare games that have queer content as opposed to games that are made by and for queer people, where queer narratives are much more centered. Um, and queer characters and relationships aren't optional content. They're kind of like the main content. They're the reason people are there. Um, and so that's just kind of an interesting thing in terms of, well, there is a growth in representation. It's almost always sort of the side choice. It's something that you can do if you want to, but you're not required to. And people can just entirely avoid it if they want to. So, as um, Xavier and I are doing this work of updating and expanding these visualizations, we've really been thinking a lot about the difficulties of visualization in terms of capturing queer content, capturing queer identities. As I mentioned in both sort of racial categories and gender and sexuality, there's this tricky aspect of this work where the characters themselves don't necessarily explicitly identify as something, right? They don't necessarily, they aren't sort of marked or described or defined in a specific way. And so that puts us in this weird position of either leaving them in an indeterminate category or trying to sort of like force them into like these identity categories in order to sort of count them in the data set. Um, and that can be sort of, it's, it's tricky, but it's also sort of potentially violent. And so we're really interested in finding ways of doing this visualization work that don't do that, right? That, that don't sort of force people into identity boxes or force identities onto characters that might not claim them themselves. Um, do, 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 do. Um, and I'll just go to the last slide since I think I'm about out of time. Um, as part of this, we're really interested too in building queer visualizations that aren't kind of your, your standard sort of pie charts or you know bar charts, line charts, these sorts of things, but really trying to build visualizations that are more fluid and more capable of capturing uh, queer identities um, that are more dynamic than that, right? They're not static identity categories that don't shift over time. Um, and so being able to capture more sort of the spectra of queer identities and queer lives, rather than focusing so much on these static and limited identity categories that put us in these weird positions where we have to make those decisions. 
So thanks so much for listening. Uh, we'd love to talk to you, hear your thoughts about this. Please reach out to us um, and, and please keep digging through um, those links that I had sent earlier as well. Um, and yeah, thank you so much.